Welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be talking about the concept of the last 12 months or LTM financial metrics here. Now, this is something that we've referenced in quite a few previous videos and lessons, but I want to go into a little bit more detail on it here and show some different use cases. This is definitely more of an on the job topic than an interview prep one. It could still come up in interviews, but the specifics are unlikely. And I would say it's probably something that's more likely to actually come up in case studies and modeling tests, if anything. There are quite a few articles about this topic and some existing coverage, but I found that a lot of it doesn't really go into depth. They sort of explain how you calculate these metrics, but they don't really explain the why or the motivation for using them or how you use them in different situations. To calculate the last 12 months of a metric, you take an income statement or cash flow statement number like revenue, and then you start with the most recent fiscal year of the company. And then to calculate the LTM version, you take that fiscal year number, you add the most recent interim period revenue, and then you subtract the revenue from that same interim period in the previous fiscal year. So I'm going to show you a diagram here to explain it because in words, it sounds a little bit confusing. And then I'll actually show you a calculation for this in Excel. Let's say that we are dealing with a company in 2024 and 2025, and the company's fiscal year goes from January through December in each year. Right now, 2024 has passed, and so has Q1 of 2025, and so most companies have released their financials for these periods. Therefore, to calculate the LTM number as of now, as of early June 2025, we start by taking the entire fiscal year of 2024, then we add the first quarter of 2025. We don't care about the projections for the rest of the year. We can just ignore those because those are not the last 12 months. Those are the next 12 months or some other future period like the next fiscal year. And then we simply subtract this same Q1 from the 2024 numbers. So we subtract the Q1 2024 numbers and that gets us the LTM number like that. And so the LTM period in this case is April 1st, 2024 through March 31st, 2025. Now, if you want to do this in Excel, I have a very simple example here for this midstream company in the US, Western Midstream Partners that we're using in an upcoming case study and financial modeling course. And I have a summary of their stats down here with the revenue, the EBITDA, the distributable cash flow. I also have their Q1 results. Now, to get these numbers, you would have to go to the company's 10Q and go to the most recent 10Q that they've released, which is for Q1 in this case, and you would get the revenue from here, and then you can calculate the EBITDA by taking the revenue and subtracting the cash operating expenses and COGS. And you can go through my highlights here if you wanna follow this yourself. You also need the full fiscal year numbers from the 10K. And so for this one, you need to go to their annual income statement and get the revenue from there, and then go through the whole process of calculating EBITDA based on that. Now, once you have those numbers set up in Excel, I'll just pull in the, the fiscal 2024 numbers here. So once you have all these set up to calculate the LTM number, you take the fiscal 2024 number, then you add the most recent quarter. So Q1 in this case, and then you subtract that same quarter from the previous fiscal year. So Q1 of fiscal 2024, and that gets you the LTM revenue we can apply the same approach for everything else, the EBITDA, cash interest expense, the distributable cash flow, all that, and even the distributions. In other words, the dividends that this midstream company pays to its limited partners, its normal or common unit holders or investors. So that's how we can calculate the LTM metric from that. And then once you have that, it flows through to the rest of the model. And you'll see it in places like the valuation for the public comps, where we have the LTM EBITDA for the companies, for example. The rationale for this is that the LTM metrics, rather than simple historical fiscal years, tend to capture the most recent business performance and trends more accurately. So they're a little bit better to use. And depending on how far along in the year you are, they could be quite a bit different from the most recent fiscal year. If you're in Q1, you may not see a huge difference, but once you get to Q2 and Q3 and closer to the end of the year, you will see bigger differences. Now the LTM calculation only applies to income statement and cash flow statement metrics. You can't LTM a balance sheet metric. So there is no such thing as LTM accounts receivable because the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. If the metric does not track what happens over a period of time, you cannot take the last 12 months of that metric. 
LTM revenue and EBITDA are commonly used in public comps and precedent transactions. We have some separate detailed tutorials on those, so I'll link to these and you can refer to these and see some examples there. LTM metrics are also very important in quarterly financial models because you forecast the balance sheet and cash flow statement line items all the time based on the company's LTM performance rather than its simple quarterly or monthly or even its last fiscal year performance. So that's the short outline. If you want the written version of all this, the images and the Excel files, you can go to this URL on screen. It's on our finance knowledge base page, last 12 months LTM. As usual, I'll link to this below the video. So in this tutorial, we're going to go into the following points in a little more depth. First, I'll talk about LTM metrics and quarterly models. Then we'll go through LTM multiples and comparable companies and precedent transactions. Then we'll look at the LTM versus NTM or next 12 months concepts, how the calculations differ and when you might use each one. And then we'll talk about what to do when you have misaligned fiscal years. This is a little bit more of a complicated topic and we can't do a full treatment here, but I will at least introduce you to the basics. So in annual models, you often link items like accounts receivable and inventory on the balance sheet to income statement metrics like revenue and cost of goods sold. And you forecast them based on that because there's a direct link with inventory. For example, anything that the company purchases and then eventually sells will show up within cost of goods sold when it is actually sold and delivered to the customer. In quarterly models, Items like AR and inventory reflect cumulative changes over long periods, so it's better to use the LTM versions of revenue and COGS and so on rather than just this quarter's numbers. So I'll bring up this example for this quarterly model in our advanced M&A and merger model course, where we go through quarterly models for the acquire and target and then combine them in a quarterly merger model. So if you look at how we're projecting many of these items, accounts receivable is a percent of LTM revenue, and then inventory is a percent of LTM COGS. And so when we calculate this number, if you look at how it's set up historically, we're taking the accounts receivable, for example, and then we are dividing it by the previous four quarters. So we get the LTM revenue, which changes each quarter as more and more time passes. And then in the projected period here for accounts receivable, let's just go over and take a look at it. What we're doing here is taking, once again, the LTM revenue over these past four quarters and then multiplying by the number right here that we're assuming. And then in future periods, we go back and we actually average the numbers over previous quarters to get these. Now, in this case, this company is not particularly seasonal. So this point does not make a huge difference here necessarily, but if you are dealing with a seasonal business, this idea becomes more important because companies tend to plan for seasonality. They're generally not going to spike up or down their inventory for just one quarter if they expect much higher sales in one quarter, they're probably going to start preparing for it at least a couple months or maybe even a couple quarters in advance. So you have to consider the business activity over the entire trailing 12 month or last 12 month period, not just what's happening in a single quarter. And that's why this metric is important in these quarterly models. LTM metrics and multiples are also important in comparable companies and precedent transactions. LTM revenue and EBITDA are widely used in precedent transactions to capture recent performance, but also to normalize deal pricing. Acquisitions can be announced on many different dates and companies have different fiscal years. But if you take the LTM period, that's standardized because it always means the 12 months before any deal was announced. So although deals might be announced in different years and in different months, you're always going to look at that 12 month period before the deal announcement to get more of a standardized measure of what the buyer and seller were looking at before the announcement took place. If you are running a set of public comps, Capital IQ or FactSet will retrieve the LTM metrics automatically. You do have to be careful about points like leases, but that's really a separate issue. If you don't have Capital IQ access, you can also use sites like beyondspx.com for screening and data retrieval and possibly get the LTM metrics from there. So here I pulled up beyond SPX and I've just typed in this natural language query, find US based manufacturing companies with revenue between hundred million and 1 billion. Now they're listing annual revenue figures, but there may be a way to get it to actually show the LTM figures. I haven't really experimented enough with this to know, but there are probably tools like that, that let you specifically request the LTM figures rather than the simple last annual or last fiscal year figures. In terms of this point about the LTM versus NTM metrics, NTM is exactly what it sounds like the next 12 months as of the current date. So 
Going back to this example of 2024, 2025, and 2026, as of right now, since only Q1 of 2025 has passed, the next 12 months period from now would be April through June, Q2, then Q3, Q4 this year, and then Q1 of next year. So we just ignore everything else and we would ideally simply add up those quarters and we would do that based on quarterly projections. So the ideal way to do this would be to find an equity research report or other source that forecasts a company on a quarterly basis and then to simply add up these individual quarters to get the next 12 months figures. Now, in reality, it's often quite difficult to do this. You may not be able to find reports that have quarterly forecasts. You may be working with simple consensus estimates. And so in a lot of cases, you may just have to take the entire 2025 projection, multiply by three fourths, and then take the 2026 projection and multiply by one fourth to get an estimate for the number. This is not ideal, especially for seasonal companies, but it might be what you have to do in some cases. Just like other projected metrics, the next 12 months numbers capture future growth and margins and they eliminate non-recurring charges and acquisitions and other items like that in the historical numbers. NTM is not that common in public comps because you normally tend to use the projected fiscal year numbers based on the fiscal year the company you're valuing, but you do see NTM more often in M&A comps. I would say it's probably the most useful in yield-based industries like midstream in oil and gas or real estate investment trusts, because there, investors are buying stocks to earn a specific dividend yield and to earn a specific amount of dividends in the future. And so they really care about these specific forward metrics over the next 12 months. Also, in high growth industries, this number can be quite important because if a firm is growing at a very fast rate, 50%, 100%, something like that, often they are being bought or sold based on their performance or expected performance over the next one to two years. One final point I wanna to touch on here is what to do when you have misaligned fiscal years. What I mean by this is that if you have a set of public comps, you might have company A with a fiscal year ending on December 31st, but then company B's fiscal year ends on June 30th. Now, if you're just calculating the LTM metrics, this doesn't really matter because you still calculate the LTM numbers for each company the same way. It becomes an issue with the projections because if you have June 30th projections and then December 31st ones, you can't really lay them out side by side in the same set of comparables. You'll notice here in the previous example, we use calendar year 2025 and calendar year 2026, CY25 and CY26, to make the point that we have adjusted this already and made sure that these companies' projections end on the same date, which is important because one of these companies, NGL Energy Partners, actually has a March 31st fiscal year end date. So we had to make a few adjustments there and multiply by fractions to deal with this issue. So the standard solution here is calendarization. I think it's just easier to show you a diagram of what you actually do when this happens. So company A here has a fiscal year ending in December. So their projections for 2026 go from January through December of 2026. Company B's fiscal year ends on June 30th. So their projections go from July 2025 through June of 2026. And then again, the next year from July of 2026 through June of 2027. So in this case, what we'd have to do to align this is to cut off the first two quarters in the first year and then the last two quarters of the next year. And then that part in the middle would give us 2026 projections, calendar year 2026 projections that align with company A's and then we could actually use this in the set. And to do this in real life, again, there are different options. Ideally, you would get the quarterly projections and add them up, but if you can't do that, you might take the first year and multiply by 50%, and then take the second year and multiply by 50% and add them together as a rough estimate. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. LTM metrics and quarterly models are quite important because you forecast many items like AR, inventory, and other balance sheet line items based on the last 12 months of performance to reflect how many of these items show cumulative trends and overall expectations over time, especially when you're dealing with seasonal businesses. LTM multiples are widely used in comparable companies and precedent transactions. And I showed you some examples, including the very simple Excel file we're dealing with here. Overall, LTM numbers give you a better sense of recent business performance, and they often make companies' market prices and market values make more sense when you see how they've been doing recently.
There is this related metric, NTM, or next 12 months, and it's really what it sounds like. You go forward over the next four quarters for the company based on whatever date you're on and the most recent financial report they have released. Sometimes you cannot find quarterly projections, so you'll have to use fractions to calculate this and take one year's numbers and multiply by a half, and then the next year's numbers and multiply by half, or maybe it's one-fourth or three-quarters, depending on the timing. When you have misaligned fiscal years, it's not really an issue for the LTM metrics because you're always calculating it based on the same last 12-month period. So the company's fiscal years might be different, but the period that you're calculating the numbers over is the same. Where it really creates an issue is in the projections, and you will have to calendarize in that case by adding up individual quarters or using fractions or some combination of that. That's about it. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the last 12 months and next 12 months metrics and how you might calculate and use them in real life.